Welcome everyone to the creative industry session. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will uh, take you through a number of talks, introductory talks uh, during the session. Uh, and then uh, we'll get to the main panel discussion uh, at the end. Uh, the theme uh, for our session is communicating metamaterials through design and creativity. How best we can do that. Uh, on the panel, uh, we have uh, Chris Lefteri, uh, founder of Chris Lefteri Design, uh, who will give us an introductory talk on design visualization of design concepts. So creating demonstrators for metamaterials. Uh, we have Dr. Olga Kravchenko, Head of Design at Rion Labs, uh, who will give us a talk on commercializing metamaterials through data-driven design, uh, followed by Professor Veronica Capsali, Chair in Material Technology and Design uh, at the London College of Fashion, uh, who communicate uh, metamaterials to technology, how we can do that to technology, uh, metamaterials technology to designers. We will be joined by Dr. Kevin Mitchell, uh, who is the metamaterials lead at Kinetic. Uh, and uh, Kevin Mitchell will, uh, uh, will answer any questions you have on the technology. So if we can make a start, uh, our uh, sponsor for this session uh, is the Materials and Designers Change. Uh, and I am uh, Dr. Robert Kwashi, uh, I'm chair uh, of the Materials and Design Exchange uh, Partnership. Uh, I work for KTN as head of materials uh, and uh, uh, the Meta Materials Innovation Network uh, is, is led uh, from uh, our team. The Materials and Design Exchange has, was formed through a partnership uh, of materials uh, uh, organizations and individuals uh, interested in that interface between materials and design in partnership with uh, uh, design organizations uh, such as the Royal College of Art, the Institution of Engineering Designers. Uh, we have the Crafts Council. Uh, we have Baron Goose Studio, uh, UCL Materials Discovery uh, a group within UCL quite keen on the design interface uh, and creative in, uh, interfaces, uh, a small company uh, interested in that interface as well. So together we formed this partnership and we've carried out a lot of activities uh, just to bring up the uh, importance uh, of uh, the two communities uh, working together. And the main point is not to create a gulf uh, between uh, material scientists, and engineers, uh, when they're doing their work uh, and uh, designers and makers uh, and leave that middle gap uh, of considering uh, how to manufacture uh, the invention itself and the market appeal of that invention, uh, the function, the two sides, the two communities can work together to address those. They're equally important in the, uh, the discovery phase as well as the creation phase. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about what MADE is doing, uh, you've got the link there, uh, MADE.partners. Some examples, really, it's about the people, the scientists, the designers, people from the creative industry, gathering, talking around the theme. So you got the first theme there around the 2012 Olympics and how the UK can be supported through science and design uh, through to some brainstorming activities where again, we mix, we group uh, to tackle uh, challenges. Uh, we have high profile uh, designers, uh, product designers uh, being asked questions and talking about their experiences. Uh, and we have hands-on uh, activities that should show how materials can be made uh, and uh, learn from the difficulties and have that input from uh, product designers. 
Difficult materials issues are tackled. So we're trying to tackle metamaterials. Uh, as, as a joint community, we've come together to look at designing with graphene and other advanced materials. Uh, and it was a very lively sessions. Uh, we had the difficulties designers had in, in getting hold of graphene samples, more reliable ones, quality. Uh, and uh, 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 again, as a group, we visited many events that are either materials led or uh, design led. Uh, and one example is the new designers uh, where, we, where we took material scientists uh, to have a look at what the product designers are doing, uh, final year students showcasing their work, their choice of materials, uh, you know, how they went about choosing the materials uh, and really looking at what advice the uh, material scientists can give. Uh, and in reverse, uh, we had uh, product designers visiting the materials research exchange, uh, which is focused on materials development, uh, ready to take to market, and ask the designers their view uh, of the way the material scientists were presenting their work. So it is an active program uh, of you know, helping uh, not just the, uh, the discovery phase, not just the beginnings, uh, but really looking at you know what key com big companies are doing uh, in the selection and choice of materials uh, when it comes to uh, uh, end of life. Uh, and the typical designer approach was to do an autopsy, uh, break it all down, uh, note how difficult it is to disassemble, uh, and see whether the design process can do something about it. Uh, and the number of materials that are used to create the function uh, that uh, the product uh, makers uh, desired in their brief to the designers. Uh, and, and it raised a, little, a lot of questions. And again, if you take a typical door, uh, the number of paths that are going there to create a functionality uh, that's required in terms of automation. Uh, the question is asked, can you use a different type of material? Could you use a meta material? That's highly functioning uh, and uh, replace a lot of the parts. Less material, uh, more easy to disassemble. Uh, so those questions were raised, uh, you know, with the brand owners. To turn our attention more specifically to metamaterials, uh, we've uh, uh, had the product designer interview uh, the technologist the uh, investors and manufacturers within the uh, metamaterials uh, arena uh, to talk about how design can help them. Uh, the, you know, their thoughts around design, what level of design thinking goes on when they make a choice to uh, scale up a particular metamaterial. Uh, and we've had a series of uh, three podcasts and Kevin Mitchell, uh, who will be on the panel, uh, give a podcast uh, in, the, in the last one. If you want to uh, visit uh, our website uh, to hear the web, web uh, listen to the web podcast, uh, the link uh, is, is there in the slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, so following this uh, introduction to MADE and why MADE is important, uh, sees the uh, activity uh, in metamaterials interface with design as very important. Uh, I'll uh, like to invite uh, Chris Lefteri uh, to uh, give us a chat. Thank you, Robert. And um, it's a pleasure to be working with, uh, with Made Again, KTN, and Innovate UK. I've had a long history over the years um, of trying to engage designers with technology. Uh, my company is based in, in London and I have an office in, in South Korea and over a period of 20 years when I first started to become very interested in materials, I, I founded basically a, a design studio, a product design studio that puts materials at the front of the product development process, which is quite unusual for um, for designers. Generally, designers are taught to, you know, sketch something, develop something in 2D, 
And then once that's been designed, then to actually think about the materials that go into that product. And my philosophy is, you know, rather than do that, let's start with the materials and let's start with what those materials can do and look at how that as a starting point becomes the, the innovation. Uh, it's much easier if you've got the technology, you understand it at the beginning of that process rather than I've designed something now I want to use. I need to source a very specific technology or material. And the kind of companies that we work with are consumer focused companies. So uh, automotive brands, uh, consumer electronics brands, companies who make appliances or mobile phones or laptops. So we're dealing very much with, with that end user and that end user experience. And in the process of, of researching materials and technologies and then recommending their application for a designer, we have to think really carefully about what the value is for the consumer because we are ultimately designing products for consumers with the designer as the intermediary. So we have to communicate to the designer, the industrial designer, the value of the material for the consumer. And I think this is the big thing that I want to, to get across, which is that if we're looking at uh, science uh, or metamaterials specifically, what's the connection and the value uh, for an end user uh, being a consumer, the end user in this case being a consumer. And I think with any sort of technology uh, exchange between science and the creative industries, there has to be a, a, um, a bridge. And, and um, Robert talked about that, the, the gap between these two industries, which, you know, on a, on a global scale exists. I've done projects for similar organizations in Singapore where they have these innovative technologies and then need to find applications for them. This is, you know, this is not a UK based problem. This is a, a global, a global thing. So the fact that we're having this discussion today is, 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 you know, is the starting point. It is a great starting point because the designer has the ability to, um, to bridge this gap and, and to be able to see the value of these technologies for consumers and, and, and actually to make that valuable for that consumer. And I always think that materials or technologies, and I think the line between the two is becoming increasingly blurred, um, are, I kind of see them as characters and I see them as having very specific characteristics that should be translated into, into that product. Because if we look at um, you know, any sort of product or any car interior, for example, materials or technologies are really at the heart of those stories and brands are using these technologies to promote the product um, and to actually promote the product in terms of why the consumer cares so at the heart of all these um, technologies is a story and it's about making sure these stories become something quite tangible so I just very quickly want to share um, a project that I did in the past with um, with uh, Made, which was actually looking very specifically at energy harvesting and how we can uh, use energy harvesting technologies and actually build values for consumers. So we looked, at, we we ran a workshop um, in London with technology providers, uh, with innovators, and then got a group of designers together to. Uh, take part in this workshop, listen to the te technologies, extract the values, the key um, propositions, the benefits, and then look at where, in this case, energy harvesting technologies could be applied to consumer products. And as I said, the whole purpose of this was to build value um, in something that was that was product centered and also was accessible in terms of um, showcasing to designers where these opportunities lie. I won't go into the details, but well, one of the technologies we're looking at um, uh, piezo uh, electric ceramics, which were taking uh, vibration in the context of a vacuum cleaner, sorry, uh, washing machine or or dryers, um, and turning that energy, that wasted energy, into a charge for potentially, um, you know, your mobile phone. The second one was looking at again vibration for the same technology and taking the vibrations from vacuum cleaners as a as a way to harvest the energy. And then the last one, which was um, uh, this technology, which was taking um, 
the heat is the technology the material is called power felt and taking the the um wasted heat from boiling a kettle and turning that into um a whisk for frothing a milk so and the, and these are the kinds of this is the exactly what i was trying to explain which is the value of turning technologies which is data driven into something that has a value for um uh, for consumers and i think the this area or, or this exchange between science and design is is incredibly fruitful because um it, it and i've seen many many presentations not just from uh you know research and scientists but actually from commercial organizations who are maybe making you know uh chemistry and polymers or or advanced um ceramics or glasses and you know this conversation is very much about data these conversations in powerpoints are very much about data and then when i'm listening to these conversations i have to extract that data and say well what's the point of this and the relevance for a, for a consumer so i'll leave that introduction and um hand over to uh olga or veronica i can't remember who's next I'm next. Thanks, Chris. You froze a bit. Can you hear me? Um, right. So I will share also a few slides. Um, So I uh, I'm, I'm head of design at a company called Real Labs, which was founded by Dr. Dan Plant and uh, uh, his research into non-Newtonian materials. And he developed that company over 15 years before it became commercial uh, at Imperial College. I personally, my background is design. I initially started, uh, studied industrial design and um, um, my kind of even in my studies uh, was very interested in uh, metamaterials, particularly mechanical metamaterials. So anything that we can do with more clever sort of structures of the raw material, and effectively my career and my master grad studies are dedicated um, to how we I can both educate that and uh, make make that into a commercial process. So. I'll quickly recap on the Rion technology. Uh, effectively, the technology is a, com is a synergy between two things. One is a strain rate sensitive polymer, which is effectively a material that is soft and flexible in its natural state, but under any applied force like vibration or impact, it stiffens. And the other is how we uh, design uh, these different uh, metastructures and geometry that you can see here. So the real key core competence of, of the business is effectively changed by how we design and tailor this to different applications. What you can see in the video, and effectively the effect of Rion technology on the passive impact. So if you have a 40 millimeter ice sheet with no Rion or under impact, it shatters and with Rion it collapses. It stays um, intact. Because of the fact that sort of the founder and we, a lot of the people involved in the company, including myself, sort of come from a very strong research background. What the challenge I had is effectively how to tailor a very research approach to kind of finding the right design for different uh, applications. And primarily the markets we're dealing with, at least now, are uh, very sports oriented. Uh, is how do you turn that into a commercial process, which is not a very straightforward uh, thing. So for us, we're trying to sort of time limit the different steps we have, but we always start with research, with sort of research and understanding what we've done and looking into maybe existing literature. And then we have a design process that I'll explain a bit later. And we have 
the ability to quickly and rapidly prototype different small uh, samples, test them, and then feed that data back into the sort of what we call the computational model until we get the sort of the optimized result. So this is how we commercialized the sort of the designs, um, the process that we came up with uh, while still at in the college. So the process we are following, uh, is we for designers to be able to design meta materials or meta structures, uh, we effectively rely a lot on computational design and using code. Um, and one example that you can see here uh, that we do, and it very very varies for every product, but we try to sort of analyze all the data that should influence the design and it could be performance data it could be things like you see here so biometric scan data and uh, instead of designing the what the final outcome should be we're designing you know what is the logic that the design should follow so what are the rules that's supposed to drive our design and how we build the code that spits out that design and we do have control over it until we get sort of the right final result that we're happy with. But what you see in the example here is effectively for a motorcycling knee guard, we're taking a, a body scan uh, and then analyze the sort of the distances and relationship between uh, the bones, skin, soft tissue, and what does that mean for the design? Because we can't really treat anatomically different body parts as if they're the same. Uh, in terms of how they should, you should apply protection to. So, as I said, there's a, could be a lot of things that drive our design process. But what the thing I really put emphasis on with the design team here is for it not to be an engineered solution. So, yes, there is performance and there are performance standards that you need meet but it's mostly understanding sort of the real life scenario for the user and really embedding sort of the user experience and the aesthetic and weight and manufacturing sort of then in a classic designer way where a designer often kind of needs to find the, the optimal solution that satisfies commercial aspects satisfies uh, manufacturing aspect and the user aspects this what we do is effectively the same thing, but on the kind of small meta structure scale. So how do we come up with a structure that is able to sort of create all these properties without sort of one being more important than the other, all with the, with the ratio of weighting that's, that we wanted to have. So I'll quickly run through an example. I'm not sure I'm time wise, but uh, this is sort of the, the behind the scenes of um, of a motorcycling uh, body armor range. So just to show that we start, the design thinking process is still the same the way as everyone else. You would start with sketching and inspirations. Um, and then we try to identify uh, what are the sort of different things, as I said, what are the rules that should be driving our design and how we can put that into a code. So what you can see, why the sound? Here is uh, the cell packing algorithm effectively populating um, uh, the knee guard in this case uh, with the cells according to the rules that we define. What's important here is still the sort of the designer in the loop. Yes, there is a code that spits out things, but we probably generate hundreds of different very cell variations until we find the one that is uh, right for us aesthetically. Um, we don't necessarily run straight to sort of full product. So we create lots of ideas and small swatch samples that we test both for kind of looks and feel and, and but as well as you know, for performance. Um, the interesting thing we always like to show here uh, uh, is it's not a direct ratio between the amount of material you have um, and uh, the performance. The great thing about this graph is that you can see that the way you design it has more influence on the performance than the amount of material. So a solid block of material will perform worse than uh, how we design it. So I think that's a key element for me, at least for the value of designer in, in making this technology commercial. And just uh, 
one thing in sort of behind the scenes of how we also explore the comfort for for the user in in, in full uh, full prototypes. This is obviously 3D printed, uh, so it's lower resolution, but we had a big <laughs> investigation into what's more comfortable having things pre curved or flat and very flexible. So uh, it was an interesting investigation, what gives us the right properties for the user. And yeah, that's the result. I think everyone can see that on, on Rion's website, but the, the full range. I think I now will uh, hand over to Veronica. Yeah, thank you, Olga. Uh, Veronica. Hello, yes. Um, I'm just going to set this up. Okay, so um, this is me. Uh, I'm uh, Veronica Capsali, and I'm a, a researcher, senior researcher um, at the University of the Arts London. Um, and just to give you a bit of context, um, I was trained and employed as a, as a fashion and textile designer years ago, and I worked in industry before I realized I was really a researcher. Um, and I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship from Bath University to study for a PhD in engineering design. Um, and there I concentrated on how to translate behaviours from biological systems into textile design. And the outcome of my PhD was um, a new fibre technology, and it encompassed the hygroscopic shape change um, that we observe in some seed pods. And then um, this technology was developed uh, via an industrial R&D route into a commercial shape change fibre. But actually, the process itself demonstrated that information, ideas, concepts from science, in this case, biology, can be implemented into um, textile design that is in a, in a non-aesthetic way. Um, and so then my uh, academic research side of my career, with that hat on, um, I focused on working out if um, a broader audience of textile designers uh, would benefit from the approach um, that, that I developed as part of my PhD. So, so not just me, I wanted to see whether this was uh, suitable for anybody else. Um, and so I currently hold an Arts and Humanities Research Council Leadership Fellow that's enabling me to really deep dive into this question. So um, I'm gonna, my talk is not about giving any answers, but really posing some questions um, that I'm hoping will invite us all to um, look at our practice uh, from, a, from a different perspective and share insights from uh, a designer's mindset, which we've already started to see. Um, so if we start with what we know, we know designers work together with scientists and technologies and, and, and we've seen already from um, uh, Olga and Chris how that um, happens at a commercial at a commercial level. Um, and, and generally both both the speakers um, and Robert in the uh, at the beginning as well really highlighted that, um, STEM brings designers in to the process, um, traditionally to exploit new IP uh, by finding markets and applications for, for their technological outcomes. And this has, you know, this, this happens over and over again. A lot, a lot of the times you get success, you can have um, some partnerships that don't quite work out. Um, and we also heard about the role of the designer um, from both Chris and Olga in terms of building gaps and bridging between disciplines and different stakeholders and different needs and values within the design process. And um, but what I'm talking about, I'm going to talk to you about is slightly different. I'm going to focus on uh, a new form of um, equitable knowledge exchange. 
uh, between design and science uh, STEM. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at the barriers. So first of all, of course, we have very different cultures of practice. We may live next door to each other, have a drink in the, in the same pubs and share a social context, but the nature and expression of input of, and output within a professional context, our two worlds couldn't be further apart. But we usually have the same agenda and both our speakers highlighted this. We want to create something useful, valuable and innovative. And we generally want to make a small contribution to the advancement of our disciplines, be that design or chemistry or physics. But we also, within the context that we're discussing here, metamaterials and design, we work with physical, physical matter. So, Although we have a lot of data that drives the design process, in effect, we're talking about physical materials. And um, Chris highlighted from his design, uh, design materials led approach that we do need to understand how these materials work and we need to have that material experience. Um, so, how and what we can learn from each other is is the question that, that that i'm interested in and i've been thinking about that will enable us to both sides not just designers and not just uh, the, the science community to stretch the capability of our disciplines both individually and jointly so um there are obvious differences in the nature, shape and medium of the knowledge and the way we communicate with our peers and stakeholders. In metamaterials, we use theories and practice from different areas of physics and chemistry, for example. And within these natural sciences, we have frameworks that are generally expressed through the language of mathematics and, and text. So um, discipline specific knowledge can be exchanged, although the cultures of practice um, are very different between chemistry and, and physics. Um, design is also formed of many, many sub disciplines, um, and we use drawing image, color, texture, material as a common language here. And just like um, uh, journal articles embody the resources, activities and outcomes involved in uh, arriving at a particular new technology within, sci uh, within science and engineering, uh, an artifact or a product embodies the resource, activity and outcome of the, the work that has gone into developing uh, the final result. So what we, so, so what is obvious is that materials, methods and findings are expressed differently. And we use different forms of language and repositories for, for storing that knowledge. So um, we, we all use visual language, whether we like it or not. Um, in STEM, we, we usually use it to explain how something works or to show um, a close up of what something looks like. So it's sort of very observational and sort of instructional communicating, uh, communicating facts. Uh, designers use visual language uh, for the same reasons, but we also think through image and making and the equivalent information that we that we would normally capture in a journal article can be captured within a series of uh, informal sketches or prototypes that a designer creates. Hmm. And then we come to the elephant in the room, terminology, words we coin to define the work that we do. So from our research into bio related disciplines, uh, we found that the range of terminology is prolific. Just within the UK, we found that the range of bio-related terminology just within written text grew from 16 in uh, during the 1960s and 70s to over 480 
in the 1990s. So this is an increase of over 30 times, which may sound reasonable and, and, and is pretty reasonable considering the technological in, uh, advances that happened in that period. But there's a complication. Where in the 60s and 70s, the bio-related terminology were found only in texts related to STEM disciplines, by the 1990s, this had, ex this had extended to the arts sector. And then today, if you look at a, a sort of an English text-based corpus uh, like iWeb, um, you'll find that this, the range of bio-related terminology exceeds 8,700. Um, and we also have, you know, and this reflects a wide range of, of practice and examples of biology intersecting other disciplines that spans every knowledge domain that we, we, we currently have. And to make things even more complicated, the nature of terms has, has changed. Um, we have grown to use terms as a type of branding um, that individuals or organizations use as a, as a tool to make themselves look different from their peers. And we, we, we arrived at this, this conclusion um, through several different research actions. And, and one, one, one survey that we did in particular of over 200 designers who actually positioned themselves as working at the interface of biology in its, its broader sense. We found that um, there was no coherence or statistical evidence from the data we collected that demonstrated a systematic use of a particular term for a particular meaning. So what this actually means is that all these terms are meaningless and for all attempts and purposes, it's no different than saying, you know, your work is in the area of bananas in pajamas. It is, it literally has destroyed any or leveled out any meaning that can be attributed to, um, to a particular practice. And um, linguists call this uh, phenomena polysemy. And it's a real problem because essentially, especially in non-scientific communities, we're using words we don't really understand and, ultimate, and, and these ultimately have no meaning. So there's a real question here in terms of how do we share knowledge without relying on terminology? So um, I'll briefly share with you the work and what we're finding um, as part of my current project, which is called By Inspired Textiles, um, where we set out to work, we set out to understand how to share information related specifically to the structure of strong, tough materials in biology with textile designers and see if this has an impact on the way designers use resources in their outputs. So our, our job basically involved translating biological information into material science and then translating that into textile design. So we heard a lot, of, um, Olga talked about coding and, and really this is about it's it's quite similar. It's about sort of translating code from one one context into another. So it might sound a little bit bonkers, but bear with me. And actually, we got lucky. Uh, the work translating biological information into material science was already done for us by um, who's now one of our colleagues and partners, Steve Nalloway. Um, and this was done as part of his postdoc work. Um, and he came up with a, a novel way within the context of material science of communicating the reoccurring structural design elements he and his team observed as they analyzed thousands of papers on strong biological materials. So then we just had to join the dots with textile design using textile language. And in this case, it was very much around technique. Um, so here we see an example of a boxfish. And these little creatures are super tough. They're light and agile in the water. And there's been 
um, examples in the past where their structure and their shape has been used to inform the design of, of cars and other um, vehicles. Um, and unlike other fish, they're not soft bodied. So their skin is lined with a bony structure made of individual plates called scoots, which are joined together use, um, using sort of like a zigzag jigsaw type configuration. Um, and our material science colleagues call this structure a sutra. And, and you get these all over our, our skulls um, have these uh, have these uh, structures um, and how they come together. Um, there, there's there's many, many examples in biology how how you can have these joins. Um, but uh, and, and what you know and what comes from material science is an understanding of how this particular structure and this configuration enables um, specific properties that offer an advantage to the boxfish. But the lessons that we take away from this for, for in the context of textiles is thinking about joins that are designed to be weak or reversible. Now, this is a bit of a mind bender if you're a textile designer because a seam or a stitch in textiles is supposed to be strong. So um, we found some examples of how this structure can be implemented using textile techniques. And we developed a series of tools and methods to help our designers navigate sort of the translation and the coding and the decoding um, of information. And although I can't share today the outcomes of our designers who participated in our um, in our project who we collaborated with because this is work in progress and they're still just finalizing their outcomes and their their artifacts I can share that the process did not invite our designers to develop or learn new techniques or technologies it simply forced them to focus deeply into their existing toolkit and and do that from a completely new perspective. And a top line summary of the outcomes, what we're seeing coming through is that they've all created novel, innovative textile structures that demonstrate a really um, advanced uh, use of resource, material and energy resource um, in terms of efficiency, longevity and recovery. And to do this, they didn't need to read a single biology journal article or material science. Um, they didn't need to do this in order to understand and apply design principles from biology into textiles. And so we're also currently working with schools to understand if design constitutes a beneficial platform to teach biology and or material science. So completely the opposite. So where we've got information flowing from biology into textile design, we're now looking at the opposite direction to see whether textile, uh, whether design in general can offer um, a, a, a different and in a, a different platform for the dis for discussions around material science concepts, biology concepts. Um, so, so far, this project has um, taught us that information, ideas, concepts can take many forms and how these are translated comes down to the dark art of communication. Um, so what I'm going to do um, in my final slide is just um, share that I've, I've looked I typically do this. I look for a definition of metamaterials um, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that I couldn't find anything definitive, nothing like um, as worked out and clear as um, physics or chemistry. So metamaterials like bio-related uh, disciplines is a bit of a wild west. Um, so forgetting about terminology and thinking about communicating exactly what it is that, that the materials that you work with do, think about how you would describe um, 
a particular meta material that you're working with um, to a seven year old. And um, I, I drafted a series of five questions that might help the framing of thinking. And, um, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, what the, these look like from, from the perspective of, of the different members of the audience. But um, I've got a funny feeling of running out of time. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I shall say thank you very much and um, pass you over to Kevin. Okay, thanks Veronica. Uh, that that uh, should uh, inspire some questions to be asked uh, and you've asked questions as well. Uh, uh, let's have the audience play by Kevin. Hi, uh, I've done a, a presentation so I'm, uh, I'm here rather as a, a sort of technical person and as an engineer. Um, my background is that I started working in metamaterials or what's now known as metamaterial technology in 1993 in the uh, microwave or radio frequency uh, domain. Uh, uh, I've really continued working in that area ever since, uh, moving away from um, electronics and electromagnetics to encompass trying to interest designers within a very large industrial company in what metamaterials could do for them. So it was quite interesting to hear the, uh, uh, the previous speaker's thoughts on, uh, on how to communicate and how to, to pass that uh, knowledge of what metamaterial is or what it might be able to do for you on onto uh, product designers. Uh, some of my experience, uh, for example, with, with uh, aircraft designers was that we'd go and sit down and give them a presentation on how metamaterials are going to completely change how people make aircraft, and, and they will. And their question was, oh, that's great. Have you got a catalogue? And I said, well, no, we'll probably have to spend the next five years uh, developing different types of metamaterial to actually start realising the, um, the, the potential of the technology. And their response was, yeah, but I've got a design review next Tuesday. If I, do, if I can't find out about it by then, I'm not interested, I can't use it. So that's a, that, that's a very interesting aspect. Of it. If we are going to adopt metamaterials widely within design, uh, we need to be able to buy these things. We need to have them almost on a, on a catalogue basis. Um, and I guess it's uh, beyond that again. I think it's it's really a case of uh, uh, what you want from me on 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 this particular panel. Um, I did spend some years selling metamaterial technology in all its guises um, through multiple aspects of uh, microwave or structures of thermal management of infrared control uh, to the aerospace industry and it was hard work and uh, one thing I found was key that you alluded to earlier today was that there's no point having metamaterials for the sake of having metamaterials if they offer you better performance that's great fundamentally um, metamaterials have to allow you to sell more product, whatever that product is, whether it's uh, uh, a shirt, a t-shirt, uh, a pair of shoelaces or an aeroplane. They have to allow you to do that. And that sometimes means taking the metamaterial expert out of their comfort zone. So that, for example, if we take the, the, the case of an antenna, it might be the, the best antenna in the world, the best thing since sliced cheese or sliced bread rather. But if it's too heavy, if it can't be repaired, if it requires twice as much power, it's never going to get onto a, a platform. And that's also that's a difficulty for the metamaterial specialist. And it, it, it's sometimes very difficult. Uh, from a design point of view, to make that connection and, and make metamaterial experts 
understand what the role of that particular technology could be in, in any new product, as I say, whether it's a shoelace or an aeroplane. Um, so I guess beyond that, it's, uh, it's really whether there are any questions or anything that I can help out with based on, the, on uh, those decades of experience. It's, uh, we've got to that point where uh, all the panel members, if you can switch on your cameras, your videos, uh, and uh, uh, Jess, uh, if uh, there are any questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, to kick off things, uh, Kevin, if you can just sort of uh, share with us what you think uh, technology owners, like you know the, the firms you've worked with, what you think they should be doing to actually bridge that gap between the uh, the science base and the creative industries. Obviously, there's a lot more to do, but more specifically, what do you think they should be doing? It's a very interesting question because the kind of company that I've worked for in the past, they're interested in making their particular product. And if you can show them that metamaterials will help, then they'll, they'll back you. And they'll back you to a very large expect, extent, to the, the extent of involving a lot of people and spending a lot of money, millions and millions of pounds. So it's, it's perhaps less a question for the large companies that uh, could exploit metamaterials. And I think the issue they've got in the UK and, and probably elsewhere uh, at the moment is really, it's making everyone within the creative arts, within industry, within industry on, a, on a broader basis, aware of what a metamaterial is. Now, to me, having worked with these things for many, many years, and, and seen the expansion from the initial work in, in, in the radio frequency and the microwave side to encompass everything from the, the shirts I'm wearing to the chair I'm sitting on, uh, to the screen that uh, I'm watching the presentations on. Uh, we'll have metamaterial cars in the future that aren't made out of pressed steel. They'll be made out of metamaterials, I'm sure. Uh, we've discussed in the aerospace and aviation forum this morning how metamaterials are going to help enable that transition from conventional forms of delivery involving diesel powered vans to drones and how that's going to expand across, across the globe. So it's really, it, it's trying to make designers as a subset of industry as a whole, aware of what metamaterials are and how they can exploit the properties, the new properties that these materials offer in their particular, in their particular space. And say so whether it's, you know, designing a new type of, uh, of uh, jacket that changes its thermal properties according to whether it's warm or it's cold outside, or it's something that's purely fashion based and that we're um, designing fabrics that can display different concepts of color on a fashion basis, but without changing the garment itself. Uh, to, to tackle some of the sort of throwaway fashion culture. It, it, it's trying to make that, it, it's trying to get things out of academia and make meth materials a standard tool for people working in industry and specifically in design and, and, and the creative arts. Um, and I think all, all the things that KTN and Innovate UK and to some extent EPSRC are doing are actually starting to address that so that people are aware. It's been difficult over the last couple of years with COVID and we're, we're online again, whereas 
sometimes it's easier to physically sit down with people and show them samples or describe to them in, in detail what a, what a new metamaterial can do. Um, I think what's important is if the UK doesn't do it, then we'll be left behind. Well, that's a different culture. Yeah. Well, that's good. Uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. I have another question that's come in. Uh, so how early in the development process do, does the panel think uh, materials technologies and designers should interact? Uh, Chris, can I start you off on that? And I'll go around the panel. How early should this happen? We'll all agree and it should, but how early in the, in the development process? Chris? Um, I, as I said, I think it's right at the beginning and, and um... I think Kevin pointed this out when he was talking about the company he was working for that, um, you, you know, I think it's wrong to kind of um, uh, take the view that the designers need things now and therefore if it's not ready now, then it's a problem. I mean, a lot of the problems that I have with the big organizations that I work for is that you know, even even to a point, a supplier of just a regular polymer takes months and months, right? So the point is, as I as I said, put put that in the hands of the designers early on, so that, that process starts, and um, you know things can be tested, so that you know when something is found, you know it's a green light. You don't have to then go through the whole process and try and fit it into a production cycle. So as early in the process as possible. Thank you. Olga. Yeah, I agree. I, I, as I said in the presentation, I see designers as sort of being the central piece that connects all the others and tries to kind of make that happen. What I often see in industry is, so at least for mechanical structures, is things that are very, very engineered and not necessarily have that sort of design thinking embedded in them. And I think at least from my perspective, that makes a huge difference is, is the ability to synthesize all these different things. Because I think designers are actually quite excited about this field and probably find it more technically challenging and challenging to find the right people to collaborate with to make their dream come true. So the early, you know, this is the start of the process, putting a team together uh, of all the relevant sort of technologies in one room. And then, then you get sort of the optimal result. Thank you. Uh, Veronica, anything to add? Yeah, I would add um, that what we need to understand is that, you know, the, the, what a designer um, can offer isn't just the f finding a final result, uh, a final application and, um, you know, uh, demonstrating it. Uh, and design thinking and that sort of broader approach um, is is really really valuable and that in actual fact you know um, a bit like uh, Chris's approach where you know it's materials driven you could you know it's materials driven with the polymers and all the materials that we know of and have already within our um, toolkit and we have experience working with and I think what is key is that we don't have the experience of working with metamaterials materials even conceptually so you know I think there's a lot to be said around working with um, designers you know if if the technology isn't going to be ready for for five ten years then work with the designers who will be in a position in five, 10 years and sort of really looking at helping designers understand how the materials are made, how they work, what the scale up challenges are and sort of bringing them into the world of, of, of science and the world of sort of materials and uh, engineering and really sort of share perspectives because it's, it's um, you know, you could find something out you know, a perspective, a, 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 you know, from a completely different sort of uh, position that could be really benefic beneficial and be that sort of real game changer. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, Olga, there's a specific question for you. 
uh, and it's to do with the when you describe the swatches uh, as part of your process. Uh, is is cost a barrier uh, in producing those swatches? Because you haven't got a last key manufacturing yet. You mentioned about three D printing, but it's cost a barrier when you do that sort of thing. For swatches, probably not necessarily. I mean, there's lead time on on making tools, or um, and they obviously cost something. But yeah, I would say at the development, the time is our main barrier. You always want to do more than than you, you can commercially. To, to sort of reach a specific deadline or a specific launch date for a product. Because the question really is around what help the materials technologies can give. Uh, uh, if you know they work with you early on to actually look at the process, uh, and there might be some innovative processes that would be rapid prototyping. I uh, remember 3D printing at the early stages was touted around as a you know, most rapid prototyping process. Uh, uh, and and uh, but was it cost effective? But yeah, it's from a materials technologist point of view, rather than waiting for the actual manufacturing process, could they be involved in you know helping you to develop a process for your prototyping? Yeah, maybe I, I should have probably mentioned that. So we three D printed tools, not the uh, well, we can three D print the actual swatches as well, but we three D printed tools, and that gives us very fast turnaround on the new prototyping. Okay. Uh, Kevin, do you think material scientists can help the designers with their sort of need for small, small, pro you know, uh, prototypes, uh, make it more cost effective? Uh, pro perhaps, you know, looking to look like, you know, the actual thing when they come to scale it up, rather than have that difficulty in translating from what they've used to produce the swatch to what can be the actual manufacturing process. Do you think materials technologies can help? Well, I'm sure they can. Um, I think overall, if we are going to get the best out of metal materials and, and, and get the best out of them for the country, um, it's a case of education. Uh, so people coming out of universities need to know what a metal material is in their particular discipline. We need to make available uh, facilities for people to upgrade the skills who are already in industry. Um, and we need to have that, uh, that manufacturing capability and that design capability at the same time. Um, as you said, Robert, there have been quite significant advances in, in uh, 3D printing technology. And I've used that in the past to demonstrate a metamaterial. material. It wasn't made out of the actual underlying material that the final product would have been, but it was incredibly useful in putting down in front of someone who might have been a, a high level program manager and didn't understand what the meth material was. Um, if you could actually take something and put it down on their desk and say, it looks like this, it won't be made out of this plastic, it'll be made out of some other materials. And it's uh, exactly the same as the structural material you used to use, but it's also the best radome in the world. And it was really helpful. So in terms of being able to rapidly prototype or even rapidly demonstrate things, yeah, it's, it's, it has value. Um, and material scientists and production engineers will, will, will help us to uh, uh, to get get the benefits in, in, in that way and being able to to show things to people and to evaluate things very quickly. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, there's a question here for you, uh, Veronica. Uh, uh, are you advocating that communicating in industry language is better uh, for the product designers than, uh, than using all those scientific terms? I think that we need to work out, we need to understand that we both have, you know, that the different disciplines have different, you know, different language, they've got different terms and different cultures. And it's about understanding each other's culture and putting ourselves, you know, and sort of, 
you know, a bit like a no knowledge exchange. We need to be able to make sure that we're using uh, that everybody's speaking from, um, you know, from is on the same page. So, you know, the way that I would describe strength is very different to it with it from a textile perspective is a very is very different to the way a materials engineer would describe strength. So, you know, it's, it's really sort of leveling things out. And it's not about, you know, uh, dumbing down or anything like that. It's about being, um, being, um, 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 how do you say it? It's, it's understanding that, you know, we, we both come from very different experiences and, and worlds and use lots of things, you know, do things that are the same, but we don't necessarily have the same language. So it's about sort of just trying to make sure that every, you know, that designers understand how metamaterials work and what the problems are, you know, to as much detail as the designer would want and not assume that they don't, you know, they don't understand or they're not interested because that insight um, is really, really important to a designer, but it, it doesn't have to be communicated in, you know, if you, if you, sh you know, if I would show a, a sort of a, formula to one of my PhD students, um, you know, they wouldn't know what to do with it, you know, so you do, but if I explained it, uh, or, or sort of communicated what that meant in different in different terms, then it would be completely different story. So it's not about, it's about being inclusive and, and sort of coming up with inclusive approaches to sharing knowledge and information. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, and it's related to these, but Chris, I'll pull this to you because it was addressed to you. Uh, and uh, when, when when you sort of talk to, uh, uh, you know, material technologies to, to get your brief, and they use those complex technical uh, details, uh, are you able to translate it yourself? Or following Veronica's uh, advice there, uh, recognizing that that translation perhaps needs to come from them. They need to learn your language rather than you having to learn their yeah. language, or is it both? Yeah, but also I, 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 I kind of feel that the conversation is a little bit one-sided to, to scientists, and it's like, what are you going to do for us? It, it, I mean, you know, designers have a whole set of other issues as well, and, and it isn't just a one-way thing. I think it's a, it's a very good question, because the, the, the translation, it's, it's not like, it's, there is... Um, I think the first thing is the discussion. And we talked about this. I think, Robert, you mentioned it right early on. You know, it was about um, uh, not working in silos, you know, so that you, know, you, don't, you don't have science and then design. I think it's about discussions and events like this happening so that these discussions can take place because these discussions allow for, you know, questions and, 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 and data is okay. I don't, I don't, I don't mind data. But I would, it then allows me to ask, you know, I think quite um, important questions like, well, I understand what it is you're saying with that data, but tell me why it's better than something that doesn't already exist. And, and those are the, I think that that's, that's the more valuable than necessarily the translation. I think that on this big picture of, um, of this big discussion that we're having, which seems to be dominating the, 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 you know, the, uh, the event, it, which is about, you know, communication, I would say that um one of the most important things ab above language above you know anything else is is samples and, and and whether those samples are physical demonstrators or whether they are some some way digital but it's about it's about making something that you can put in front of another person whether they're you know in industry designer and, and it demonstrates very tangibly the benefit or, or, or what it is that something can do. And as I said, I mean, it physically, you know, because I tend to work a lot with physical materials. And if somebody says, you know, this has incredible strength or lightweight, it's like, yes, against what? And show that to me, you know, make that powerful through something physical. Uh, but I understand that for metamaterials, that might have to be something digital. Because, and, and, and I think you said it right at the beginning again, Robert, that it is about the gap. And the gap is really important to me because the gap means that, 
in the, in the space between what somebody tells me and how I understand that and how I interpret it, that's where the creative moment comes. And you've got to have that kind of gap because you don't, I don't, I don't want to be told specifics, you know, that dictate what I need to do. I just want, I want to find that out myself. And I want that kind of realization moment of, oh yeah, I can do this. So it's about having, I think it's about those exchanges rather than the translation part. Thank you. Uh, there, there's a question here for each member of the panel. Uh, and I'll start with you, Olga. Uh, it's really what you would recommend. I think we all agree that, that uh, you know, uh, designers, creative industry, uh, players, uh, material scientists, materials technologies all need to interact you know, at the early stages. Uh, what would you recommend as the engagement process for that? How, how would you see it starting off? Uh, is it at events like this? Uh, are there any other form of engagement you think will work very well? That's a question. Definitely. Yeah, yeah sorry. I start us off, but it's a question to everyone. What would you recommend that as the engagement process at those early stages? I mean, yeah, it, it could be events like this. One thing I feel like um, maybe underutilized is what happens when you're in college or in the academia. I feel like, yes, students are encouraged to collaborate, but it's not really, we could do more in that sense. And particularly with Meta materials, at least what the sense I get from, from Imperial College is there are projects that are dealing with meta materials and, and mechanics and design engineering in different departments, but they don't necessarily communicate one to another. And they feel like they're doing completely different things. So I feel definitely starts there with kind of incorporating more education and collaboration. I can go next. Um, yeah, yeah, Chris. Yeah, I think um, Olga had a picture, maybe Veronica as well, of um, of this kind of brainstorm. And, you know, the, the slides that I showed at the beginning was an event where, you know, different um, uh, researchers presented technology to a group of designers in the audience. And then, and then there was dialogue and ideation and brainstorming around that. To me, that's a, a fantastic... Um, you know, scenario because you have the you have the presentation of the information, you have the evaluation of that information, allowing for questions. Then you have the um, exploring of of whatever, and you set the agenda, whether it's to find a final application or to find a way to communicate the technology, depending what the, what the outcomes you want to be. But I think those those kind of creative workshops of um, you know people brainstorming and discussing ideas, I think is is, is the perfect scenario. Thanks. Olga, uh, Olga you've answered. Veronica? Um, I'm going to go a step further and, and sort of build on what both Olga and Chris have said in terms of um, education and, you know, brainstorming and working together and, 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 and sort of think about it from the perspective of experience and, um, and, and almost legacy. I mean, we all know what a, a piece of wood looks like and how it feels like, and we can imagine how it um, it would be like to work with. Um, so we have that experience, although we haven't done it ourselves, we, we understand the processes that are involved. So the question here is, how do we make sure that future generations of budding designers, product designers, uh, technologists, have the, the that equivalent experience of meta materials in their you know in their consciousness so how you know so and then you know i'm obviously going to say because i love working with schools um i'm i'm obviously going to say you know get the kids involved you know introduce it into the curriculum um but that comes with with all sorts of problems but it's you know if we look at what's happened with biomaterials and and sort of like over the last 10 years you know most design students have grown something in their kitchens you know everybody has an exp experience of working with that type of 
biotechnology in the broader sense. So <clears throat> even though, you know, something that's, it's not commercially available yet, you know, we're not buying clothes that are made of mushroom leather, but a lot of designers have experience of working with those sorts of materials and technologies. And it's sort of thinking about, about how you join the dots between what is involved in a mess material and you know how you sort of capture the imagination and 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 of of sort of stakeholders at, at different in, across different generations in order to develop that that experience and understanding of working with that or you know the or potential of a particular material thank you kevin can i spin turn, turn that question on his head and actually say uh the designers are all in agreement, isn't it? That you know, there are different ways of, of, of engaging. Uh, engaging early at uh, the early stages is important. Uh, what's stopping uh, materials technologies from engaging with designers at those early stages? I mean, we have examples where they come in later on, uh, but at those early stages, you know hearing what, what, what the other panel members are saying, what's stopping the material scientists from doing that? Materials technology from doing that? I think it's just knowledge. It's, uh, it's a two-way street. Um, if you're a designer and you know about new material, whatever it is, you might think of a way to use it. Uh, and then the opposite's also true. If, if you are developing new materials, metamaterials in this case, you need to know what sort of properties that are valuable to designers. So it's all about education and communication. I mean, it's been a topic of this discussion is communication. Um, and what's particularly interesting, I think, about metamaterials is that there, there is a, a reasonable definition of, of metamaterials that talks about them being made from... Um, small elements that are smaller than the wavelength or the, or the uh, um, length scale over which a particular phenomenon that you designed to control will change. But also that they offer something that's not available in nature, to a greater or lesser extent, perhaps. And that, that's, that's something that we, we won't have as, as, as an inbuilt knowledge, as has previously been discussed. We might know what a piece of wood is, but we think if we squash a material, it'll expand in the opposite direction, but not if it's an oxetic metamaterial. It's different. We can design metamaterials that won't allow heat to flow from hot to cold. They act like diodes. It's completely different. We can make metamaterials that will allow a hot object to emit heat in a particular direction. So you might think if you've got a, I don't know, a hot brick, for example, you put your hand in front of it, and uh, directly in front is where where you'll feel the infrared radiation. Well, it's covered with a metamaterial that infrared radiation can go in a different direction. So it's it's. It's very difficult because metamaterials can actually do these non-natural things. Um, and the only way around it, I think, is, is, yes, it's events like this, it's popular science, it's schools, universities, technical colleges, and it's making, uh, uh, making learning resources available for people who are already in, in industry. So I think the main thing is stopping people talking to each other is just that they don't know that these things exist. And they don't know, you can't use these weird non-natural uh, properties if you, if you don't know they exist. Well, at least we've got, we've got on this panel, we've got ambassadors now. Uh, we can go out there and, uh, and make sure we, you know, we spread the word. Uh, about metamaterials and, and the importance of uh, interacting with design. But if, uh, you know, listening to Kevin about those exciting properties and what you know about metamaterials, if I go around the panel, 
uh, and you think five to 10 years time, what are the exciting applications that you would like to see coming from metamaterials? You can, be, you can base your sort of uh, your view on lessons you've learned from uh, other less you know, common materials, uh, materials that have uh, had a lot of hype and that's not shown any, any of the promise commercially. Uh, you know, if metal materials can overcome those difficulties, because we're all sold on it and we'll go out there and make sure everyone is communicating. Uh, what would you like to see? What exciting application in the next five to 10 years? Chris, uh, Veronica, you volunteered. Yes, yes I'm going first. Um, I would really like to see how meta materials could help us achieve our net zero targets and use our resources more efficiently, uh, make sure we recover things, uh, make them recoverable and give our products a longer lifespan and more uses. That's great. So that's the sustainability and the circular economy all sort of rolled into one. Fantastic. Uh, Chris, what would you like to see? Yeah, I I think uh, Veronica had a, had the best I idea. I I, I think, it, but I, I, the technology that I'm most interested by in terms of metamaterials is auxetics. Uh, Kevin mentioned it. I, I think that um, auxetics to me is such a a simple idea, beautifully simple idea actually. But I, to to commercialize, I haven't seen any great commercial applications of that, particularly in you know, I think what feels to me textiles is an obvious one. Yeah, thanks. Well, this is where Olga comes in to, uh, yeah, can you let him know? <laughs> yeah, well, obviously it's the sports one, but I mean, that's to some degree emerging and happening today. Um, I think five, 10 years, definitely there will be other things. I feel that the, what I would like personally to see is the connection between things like Sort of the big data and metal materials in a much more interlinked way so that i think we have access to so much data but we don't know how to interact with it and how to access it and then we don't necessarily have a straightforward way for designers to be able to sort of absorb that data and feed that into their design i think that's at least my biggest day-to-day -day challenges and think about how the future is going to look i think it would be good to see that result and uh, have meta materials more accessible to everyone. Thank you, Kevin. What would you like to see? Oh, you've been working on this, and you've been pushing very hard to get some commercial wealth out of this. Uh, apart from uh, defense applications, where you know there's been a success. Uh, what would you like to see in the next five to ten years? I guess it's uh, it's the understanding, widespread understanding within industry and I'm including designers as, as part of industry that these things exist they can do interesting things for us um, they can actually help with the zero carbon challenge whether it's aircraft or whether it's energy harvesting whether it's thermal insulation uh, it, it, what I'd like to see on, on behalf of the UK as a whole and society as a whole is that metamaterials are understood broadly and are allowed to contribute to GDP, overall utility, the, the health of the nation, whatever, uh, in the best way that they can, that we don't miss out. Um, I think that without question, there is a lot uh, that they can help us with from the more esoteric, such as I wouldn't mind a, a shirt that expanded as my belly expands, as it sadly is doing, uh, without having to buy a new one. Uh, that's actually possible with a metamaterial fabric. Um, or if stripes are out and squares are in next year, you just download a new pattern. You don't have to buy a new garment and throw it away. Um, I think as part of that, what will be really important is not only the first use of 
metal materials in whatever area, application area it is. So you've designed your new garment that can change colour um, or get warmer or allow you to be warm in the winter and cold in the summer. It's okay, how do I repair it? How do I repair it efficiently? Um, and then when it comes, it does come to the end of end of its use, how do I break it down into its constituent parts and reuse it? Because I've not seen much going on in that area. So there's a lot of work around electronics, how you dispose of electronics, how you reuse what you can reuse. And that's all good stuff. It's good ultimately for us all on the planet. Um, I've not seen that level of attention to the product life cycle with metamaterials yet, other than the few very bespoke applications that, as you say, are related to defense. And so that, I guess the three things, the people know what metamaterials are and know how to use them, that we can repair them efficiently and that we can deal with them when they come to the end of the life. The, the, I'm being greedy and having three things that I want, but uh, I think those things would be very, very useful. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Fano. Uh, we've uh, come to the end. Now, the Innovation Network for Metamaterials is on the lookout for ideas uh, to engage with designers, uh, have the design, uh, working with designers to, to help that sort of process of wider understanding and commercialization and exploitation uh, of, uh, of metamaterials. Uh, and you've given us some very good idea. We started off really focusing on communication, uh, and I think we've done it very good justice. Uh, we've looked into the future. Metamaterials has a future, but it, it needs to be sustainable. Uh, it, it can't act Yes, just based on its own in the functionality and exciting sort of functionalities that it provides, uh, it needs to really be part of the real life uh, uh, and the way materials are regarded. Uh, some good ideas here. Uh, Bio-inspired uh, textiles you talked about, Veronica. You now have meta-materials-inspired uh, meta textiles. Maybe that will be our next design project. Uh, or uh, you know, sustainable metamaterials, uh, you know, uh, how we make sure that uh, the whole secular economy uh, metamaterials are compliant to that. Uh, but we mustn't forget early communication, getting everybody on board, uh, very important for this innovative journey. So thank you very much. And uh, see you again soon. <laughs>